The following recording is a presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Rohnert Park, California, and of Pastor Val Mark Smith. We are an independent Baptist congregation committed to the accurate presentation of the historical doctrines of the faith. We welcome you to visit our services anytime here in the Rohnert Park area. I do hope that we give you something to think about as you're singing. Uh, each word of, of that song, I think, is worthy to contemplate, take into our souls and ingest and think about what Christ has done. And uh, all of our songs, I think, uh, especially what we've sung today, has given us the opportunity to think of what Christ did for us. I, I wasn't even thinking when uh, I chose Isaiah 61 today that we would be singing His robes for mine. But in that 10th verse of the 61st chapter we read a moment ago, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. Wonderful verse, wonderful song. All right, I'd like you to take your Bibles now, and if you'll open them to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Our text today is the third chapter of Paul's first letter to Timothy, and our subject is the New Testament church. And what we're trying to do in this study is to give you a comprehensive view of the church, which has taken us into many aspects of what the church is and what the church does. Now, as I look over our congregation today, this is more of, a, more of an intimate setting, I think, probably more of just a teaching uh, setting than it is to, to preach to you, but I, I'm going to try to do a little bit of both today, preach and teach to you from the Word of God, and we hope that we'll join together and learn something, engage our minds, and take something from the Scriptures today that will help us all. Now, today we are continuing our examination of the pastoral office we're speaking of leadership, which is integral to any discussion of Christ's design for the church. The pastor is the primary leader. He is the shepherd of the church. He is the elder of the church. He is the bishop of the church. And each of those terms, the pastor, the elder, and the bishop have significance as they speak of the nurturing of the man for God's people. They speak of the respect that he is due from the people and they also speak of the administration of the church affairs, which is also responsibility of the pastor. The pastor is the under-shepherd of Christ, who is the head of the church. And if I might reverently say this to you, the pastor is the representative of Jesus Christ to the Lord's assembly. And he is to reflect all things Christ. But as I say that, both you and I know that pastors don't do this really well most of the time. Uh, we try to do as best we can to represent Jesus Christ. We leave a lot of those responsibilities undone. A lot of the abilities, many of the abilities that we have, of course, would fall short of what Jesus was. So we do fall short in the performance of the responsibility. We are human and we are fallible. But also remember that your pastor is a Christian, just as you are, and Christians are in different stages of growth, and a pastor is in his own stage of growth, and uh, as he is being sanctified and made into the Lord's image, and yet the Word of God also says that we are held accountable, even more accountable than anyone, who, anyone else who is a member of the church. Hebrews says that pastors will give an account of the way that they have ruled the body and how they watch for the souls of the people. Well, a study of the pastor's office is important for your good understanding of what the pastor does and how you relate to him. And in view of that fallibility that all of us know that I have, in view of that fallibility, I hope I don't fall too far short of your expectations. And at the same time, your expectations should not be greater than what I'm able to do. And the charity of your forgiveness for what I'm not able to do should be not less than what God himself expects. Well, in this letter to Timothy, Paul instructs 
this young man who has become the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And he teaches Timothy about church order. And his primary business in this letter to this young pastor is to set a course for how Timothy was to lead the church and to uh, teach the church the strong doctrinal truths that are expected of the pastor. A good teaching requires qualified personnel. And so, accordingly, Paul deals with the qualifications of the pastoral office in chapter 3. And then he goes on, secondly, to address the office of the deacon, which we will talk about next week. Then thirdly, he speaks of relationships in the church, how the pastor relates to the people and how the people are to relate to him. And then finally, when we get down to the end of this letter, he returns to the personal testimony of the man that God chooses to be the leader of his people. And he points out that that man must be a righteous man. He must be a godly man. He must be a man of faith, one who has patience and meekness. And what we find here going through 1 Timothy the entire letter is the most comprehensive in the New Testament regarding the right choice of a man who will be the pastor of the Lord's church. Now I'd like to read these first seven verses in 1 Timothy 3 again and then we'll continue our study of the pastoral office. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 beginning in verse number 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Before we get back into the outline of our study, I, I want to comment on Paul's estimation of the pastoral office. In verse number one, he says, if a man desires the work. He calls the work of the pastor a good work. If a man desires to be a pastor of a church, he desires a good work. Each month I receive a letter from one of the Baptist associations, and in each of those letters there's a list of churches that need pastors. Some of the churches have been on that list for months, and I've noticed even there are a few that have remained on the list for years. And part of the reason for that is there aren't enough men who desire this good work. Now I know that there are other reasons for some of these churches why they don't have pastors, but I also know this, that nationally, and, and this is a statistic that paints a broad brush, nationally across all denominations, about 1,500 to 1,700 men left the ministry each month of last year. Not the entire year, but each month of last year, 1,500 to 1,700 men left the ministry. Now, because of COVID-19, I think we're all aware that uh, this past year may well have been the worst that, uh, for the church that we've known in our lifetimes. But the exodus of men from the ministry has been going on for some time at an alarming rate. I read a statistic that said that 4,000 churches closed their doors last year for good. Uh, again, I don't mean temporarily because of COVID like we had to do, but 4,000 churches closed their doors for good. Now, I know this, that if our church was to search for another pastor today, if we needed another pastor or something happened to me, I know it'd be difficult to find another man to step in and take the position. Not only is there a shortage of men who desire the good work, but among those who want to be pastors, it is very difficult to find someone who is doctrinally and morally qualified to take the position. If we are a church that insists upon a doctrinal standard as we do, we insist upon a biblical standard, one that is historic, a standard that we've tried to 
live by these past 20 years that's been established in this church, the numbers of men who will stand with us in our doctrine, in, in the doctrines of grace, on the local church, with historical Baptist principles of, of the local church, uh, New Testament originals, the number of men who will stand with us on that is frighteningly dismal. And yet as I say this, I do know that Christ is the master of the church. He is the head. He promised that his church will survive. It will survive. Although he didn't say that it would survive without trouble. He didn't say that he would never need to visit it and at times chastise it and warn it as he did the churches of Asia in the New Testament. Remember when Jesus spoke to those seven churches in Asia, who did he address? He addressed the pastors of the churches, didn't he? The letters were written to the pastors. Each church pastor received a letter, and I believe there must have been some red faces among those pastors when they read those burning words, those fiery words that Jesus had to say about their performance. And I will say also that there should be some red faces among pastors and churches today that look at the New Testament and find out that neither pastors nor churches are anything like the church that was built upon the rock of Jesus Christ. Well, in our last message, we, we began a discussion of the way that a man becomes a pastor of the church. We're looking at the New Testament way, of course, and, and this begins with the call to the office. The way that we get a pastor, you'll get a pastor, is because there is a man who has been called to the office. A man may desire the work of a pastor, but he doesn't appoint himself to the office. A true desire, the right kind of desire, is not a natural desire. Now, if we take a reasoned, rational approach to becoming a pastor, when you look at it that way, uh, I'm talking about a desire that's not rooted in something like uh, the wrong motives as, of money and power and those sorts of things. If we take the right motive that's, that's rooted in uh, Holy Spirit guidance and, and what the Lord wants us to do, that desire to, to be a pastor won't be there unless the Lord puts it in the man's heart. And I believe that it should go without saying that a man who desires to be a pastor must be a man who loves Christ. He must be a man who loves to obey the word of Christ. That must be his driving motivation. He must be a man who's always thinking this. How can I best serve Christ? And that desire for the work begins with God's call to the ministry. Last week we looked at that as an inward call. When the Holy Spirit speaks to the man, it is an inward call. When his spirit is spoken to by the Holy Spirit, there is an inward work of grace. As the Holy Spirit impresses upon the mind of the man what God wants him to do, that God wants him in this work. And it's a good work because it's God's work. It's God's work. And only God can call that man and equip the man to do his most important work. Paul said that he thanked God that what? He enabled. It was God enabled him to be in the ministry and to preach the gospel. He was nothing like a minister of the gospel until the Holy Spirit regenerated his heart and then through his special divine graces enabled him for that work that he was called to do. Well, I, I would confess that the call to the ministry is rarely as dramatic as Paul experienced on the road to Damascus. Not many of us as pastors have blinding lights that knock us to the ground or, or whatever. But I would say that the call to the ministry, for me at least, was not any less dramatic because I was quite certain of what the Lord wanted me to do. I think the Lord can show us in different ways, uh, use different means, Paul's call was a blinding light and a vision of Jesus Christ. Mine was not like that. It was much subtler, but as I said, not less dramatic because the way that I saw it was the providential hand of God that was working out all of the circumstances for me to take the pastorate of this church. And as I looked at that, the circumstances that God was working through could not be mistaken. 
And so I don't think there's anything wrong with taking a, a logical approach and, and looking at uh, the, all the events and evaluating that, and that helps to reach a decision. So you might survey 50 pastors and ask them, why did you desire the good work? How did you know that you were uh, to take the call to become a pastor? And out of that, you might get 50 different answers. But for those that have been genuinely called by God, I know that it always turns out this way. They know they are truly called and they are fully persuaded in their minds that their call came from God. There is an inward call. But we also learned that it's necessary to affirm that call with another call. The inward call is a subjective call. That is, only the man can know that. You can't see into my heart or read my mind. You can't tell what's there, what God might have done with me. And so accompanying the inward call, there must also be an outward call. And this is where the church evaluates the man, they observe his life, they weigh his qualifications, they hear his testimony, they look at the objective evidence, and then with much prayer and with dependence upon the Holy Spirit, the church comes to a consensus that this is the man that God wants to lead our church. That is the outward call. The church agrees with what they hear. Well, we know that church agreement is not infallible. Mistakes have been made. But obviously, a man could never become the bishop of the Lord's church without the consent, without the agreement of the congregation. And though churches may make mistakes, there are fewer mistakes when the guidance of the Holy Spirit is sought. When we seek the Lord's guidance, then we can be much more assured that the choice that is made is the Lord's choice. Now the congregation then is the electing body. Their choice of the pastor is Holy Spirit led if they earnestly seek the Lord in the decision. And when the church first chose an apostle to replace Judas, they had two candidates in mind. You remember this in Acts 1? We looked at that last time. They had two candidates in mind and they put them up before the church and they prayed and they said, Lord, you know the hearts of all men. You show us which of these two you have chosen. And we believe that the Holy Spirit showed them. And when the guidance of the Holy Spirit is carefully sought, that choice will be the Lord's choice. And then when that choice is made, the choice becomes the ordination of the man to the office. Now, whatever else ordination may consist, all the ceremonies that are put with that today and all the other things that go with it, this is the bare minimum necessity. A church elects the man to the office. That is by congregational authority. Now, a, a discussion of the nature of the church would confirm that seminaries and councils and synods and hierarchies of bishops are not the authorities for ordination. The ordination belongs to the members of the local church. Well, I want to move on to the third call. You can find more information about the inward and outward calls in the last message, but I want to move into increasingly controversial territory now, and this is the third aspect of the pastoral office, the third part of the call. The third part is it is a restricted call. The call to the pastorate is a restricted call. And there are several restrictions. We'll discuss them later as we look at the qualifications that are found in the first seven verses of this chapter. And I don't think as we look through those that we'll find much disagreement that yes, a pastor should be blameless. That's what the word says. He must be vigilant. He must be sober. He must be of good behavior. There's no argument, I, I don't think, among any of us that he should not be a brawler, he shouldn't be greedy, he should not have a bad reputation. Those are all restrictions for the office. But that's not the restrictions. Those aren't the ones that are the cause of so much controversy and disagreement about who the church may call as a pastor. The major disagreement is the nine words at the beginning of this text. If a man desire the office of a bishop, if a man desire, the question, is the call to the office restricted to men? 
Now I realize that the Greek in this verse doesn't use the word man. King James translators use man. That's a fine translation. Nothing wrong with that. A good translation would also say if anyone desires or if someone desires. But is there anything in the passage or in the rest of the New Testament that does restrict the call to the office of pastor to only men? And with that, with that goes a more refined question. Are women allowed to preach in the church? And even a more sifting question, are women allowed to speak in the church? And let me say first that this question can't be answered by a vote of popular opinion. The answer can't be found in the, in the attitude of the culture in which we live. The answer can't be found in human minds as they think about fairness and equality of, of men and women. It can't be considered as if women are being unfairly discriminated against. That's not the way that we decide this. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. And the instructions for the decorum of the church, the way that the church operates, the only rules and regulations that we find for the church is the New Testament. The New Testament is the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God, and it is not God's subjective opinions of things. This, this is God's infallible declaration of truth to His church. Now, the issue of women being pastors of churches was not really a serious problem for the first 1950 years of church existence. And that's not to say that there weren't some heretical instances of it because we can see it right in the New Testament. It appears that there were times when there were intrusions of women into the pastoral teaching roles that the Lord had to rebuke or the apostles had to rebuke. The most glaring example of this would be what we find in Christ's letter to the church at Thyatira. And there in Revelation 2.20, Jesus said to the church at Thyatira, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest, or you allow, that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now let me just mention, I, this was not part of the message, but I probably should uh, make note for you that the woman's name was not really Jezebel. Jezebel is an indication of her character, what kind of woman that she was. But here the Lord calls her a Jezebel. Now if that's the only verse that we could find in Scripture on this subject, it wouldn't be conclusive because we could look at other verses and we could find many, many times that men are mentioned in Scripture that have leadership roles and they also draw the ire of God for their unholy behavior. But as I said, in the first 1900 years or so of church history, this wasn't an often debated topic. The consensus was, this is a no-brainer because the scriptures are crystal clear. And it becomes a problem for people when human reasoning is added to it and the Word of God is no longer the infallible source of all things that the church is to do for the practices of the New Testament church. Now, into the 20th century... This became more of a problem as there came the rise of charismatic churches, Pentecostal churches. They became more prominent. And before that, uh, in the 19th century, and, and, and a little before that as well, there were some of the crackpot Looney Tunes cults that had women leaders, but they never reached any mainstream recognition. Then we got into the 20th century and the four square gospel church and the Pentecostals and then there was the rise of faith healers like Amy Simple McPherson and now, yes, there are popular women preachers. But they're still mostly the anomaly. That's on the edge of things, on the periphery. And then we're soon into the culture wars of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the rise of feminism and the insistence that women should be able to hold all jobs that men hold, including the leadership of churches. In fact, uh, feminist-type churches, feminist editions of the Bible, those begin to creep their way into mainstream thinking. And so at this point, we find that many major denominations began to ordain women, Women clergy are now found in the Episcopal churches, in Lutheran churches, in the Methodist church, in the Church of God, the Pentecostals, some Presbyterians, and others. 
And we're not especially alarmed by that. Not really, because apostate churches have apostate doctrines. The underlying doctrines that these groups have that are not of the New Testament order, where they go wrong on principles of baptism, when they're wrong about salvation, when they're wrong about sacraments and so on, all, all that does is to lead to more perversions of the word. We expect that will happen. And then we expect further degradation of doctrine when the pastorate, the most prominent of all the church ministries, the most important of church ministries, when the pastorate is compromised, then we expect things to be even worse. And we've seen that. Closely following upon women's ordination has come the acceptance of LBGTQ, the ordination of homosexuals into the ministry, and it's that proverbial slippery slope, which I think we might more properly call a landslide of perversion. Now all of that is somewhat alarming. But in our Baptist churches, we've been held mostly at arm's length from these heresies. Baptists have never accepted the ordination of women. And we've held out longer than any group of Christians, and I use that term loosely and generically. But that's not to say that Baptists weren't being influenced. Go back to the 1960s and the conservative Southern Baptist Convention, that's the largest fellowship of Baptists in the country. Um, they began to stray from their strict theological moorings, and because of that, my church in Kentucky, 60 years ago, left the Southern Baptist Convention because of theological liberalism. Now, I know some of that's been done away with now, and some of the, those churches are stronger, which we thank the Lord for, but it was during that time, way back in the 1960s, around that time, that Baptist churches began considering ordaining women to become deacons. Uh, there were only a few way back then, but those few were allowed to stay in the convention and poison the pot. And I can remember my grandparents in Arkansas when I was just a little boy leaving the Southern Baptist Church over the ordination of women deacons. But as for pastors, Southern Baptist stayed the course. The convention was officially committed to the biblical standard that only men can be ordained as pastors. But now we're into the 21st century, and that wall of doctrinal clarity has begun to break down. A few months ago, the well-known Southern Baptist women's ministry teacher, Beth Moore, began to advocate for women preachers, and now she has the position that complementarianism is wrong and that women should be able to preach. And there are many prominent Southern Baptist churches that applauded her and have agreed to stand behind her. Recently, the Saddleback Church down in Southern California, whose pastor is Rick Warren, this is, of course, the Rick Warren whose claim to fame is the purpose-driven church, just recently his church ordained three women to the ministry. And now it seems that the Southern Baptist Convention is headed into the same apostasy as the denominational churches, so that these churches that once stood for the truth are now ordaining Jezebel's into the ministry. Now, and, I, and I suppose the epitome of the flip-flop of Christians on this issue is that horrid, insane inclusion of the Reverend Paula White to give the invocation at President Trump's inauguration. And she was asked to do it because she was the president's spiritual advisor. And this is the same divorced Paula White who was involved in, a, in an affair with the heretic Benny Hinn, the same Paula White, who's not much less than a demon incarnate, and we'll discuss the theology of that maybe at a later time. And then the cherry on top of all of this is the widespread popularity of charlatan heretics like Joyce Meyer, who teaches that Christians are little gods, and that you have the power and the authority of God. Now, if you listen to Joyce Meyer, you just remember she's channeling Satan. And I think that gives us a picture of the magnitude of the problem that we're dealing with. And of course, at issue is this phrase, if a man desired the office of a bishop. 
What does the Bible teach about the office of pastor? Is it restricted to men? Well, there are some indicators in the text that are just lying here like huge rocks to hurdle over for any other position. I mean, there are surface truths here that even a novice Bible interpreter can't miss. You'll fall over these. Since the qualifications for leadership and of the pastorate are expressed in only a few places of Scripture, this is the perfect place for Paul to say, if a man or a woman desires the office of a bishop. Now, perhaps that would end all the arguments and the controversy. Paul didn't say that here. The first truth that we see, just lying here for us, it says a man. Now, again, that's the King James translation, which if you were to check in interlinear, you'll see the Greek word there is translated as anyone. Well, then does that just open the door for a woman? Well, the King James translators knew as much as anybody today knows about translating the scriptures. And they knew that man is the way that this should be translated. And it's so obvious because it qualifies itself in verse number two. The bishop must be the husband of one wife. Now, I'm not going to deal with the husband of one wife, the various shades of meaning of that phrase right now. But I will say the qualification of a male is obvious because of the usage of the word husband. And then we also needn't spend time arguing about verse number 5, that it is a father, it's a male who rules the house. He's the head of the house. That's indisputable in biblical teachings in both the Old and the New Testaments. And then if you follow the passage down into the qualification for deacons, you'll see the same husband of one wife qualification. And then going on, verse number 11 has some instructions for the wives. And that's significant because verse number 8 links similar qualifications of pastors and deacons. They're linked by the word likewise in verse 8. Now we notice if the office was open to both men and women, there would surely be a section that deals with the qualifications of women. I'm not going to labor the point that men and women are different. It would be unkempt I think probably unnecessary to speak of women that aren't brawlers. We don't need a woman who's not a brawler. We need one who isn't a striker and so on. But instead, we would expect that we would find qualities more associated with women, qualities like nurturing and compassion, kindness, or some such qualities that are always associated with women. But those by themselves are not absolute proofs. Some would obviously try to skirt those, no pun intended, but they would try to get around that. But we're not left without proof here that makes everything that's just mentioned perfectly logical and gives understanding why we are expected to naturally assume that this office is for men. And the key to that understanding that Paul is speaking specifically to men is found in the preceding chapter. In, in the end of chapter 2, Paul had already addressed what women are to do, and his instructions forbid any interpretation of chapter 3 that would include women as pastors. Now, if you'll look in your Bible there, 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse number 9, it says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first born, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now he begins there in uh, verse number 9. Chapter 2, verse number 9, speaking of a woman's modesty. That would certainly have been a good characteristic to include in chapter 3, if he allowed for women to be pastors. Women are far more the objects of sexual desire than men. Uh, some of you may dispute that by looking at me, because that may not be true. But... There, no, there are, and you know this, more, more shameful thoughts and comments that are made about women 
And certainly Paul might say that, well, a woman preacher needs to be sure that she covers herself. She needs to be sure that she wears modest clothing. And you remember, even in the, in the Old Testament, it was commanded that altars were to be constructed so that priests, who were always men, by the way, so that priest did not walk up steps and automatically allow for a quick peek under the robes. So they were permitted from having steps on the altars. They had to be kept low so that didn't happen. And then going on to verse number 11 in chapter 2, things start to tighten up considerably more. It says, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Let the woman learn. Now Kevin DeYoung points out that this statement is a countercultural command that many Jews thought it was sinful for women to learn the scriptures. But contrary to that, the Christian ethic teaches that women are to learn, and I, and I would have to say I am especially pleased when I see that women are learning. And I realize that even that comment might seem to be patronizing, and because everybody's got something to complain about nowadays. You know, they, they say that the English language is the hardest to learn in the world and I think that it is because everything that you say offends somebody doesn't matter what it is you offend somebody people are so woke now you're going to offend somebody but I'm, I'm very pleased about this that, that women learn and I hear that when we're discussing scriptures when we discuss in the forum class when we're in a Bible study yes the women are learning the scriptures a few weeks ago uh, Donna Miller was, was uh, telling me about searching for a new church since they moved to Idaho and and she, when she told me what she discussed with the pastor of another church and what she and Steve believe as they were talking to him, she was reciting what she had learned in the many years of faithful ministry in our church. Well, how is the woman to learn? It tells us that here the apostle says, in silence with all subjection. She's to listen quietly and be submissive. And the next verses give us the reason. Now, I want you to notice as we read this that the context is church and worship in the church. And before we look at this here, we get a clue about this in 1 Corinthians 14 in which there's no question that Paul is speaking in the context of a corporate worship service. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, "...let your women keep silence in the churches." For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. That's, that's kind of straightforward, wouldn't you say? It's a prohibition of speaking. And the reasons for this are repeated in 1 Timothy 2.12. If you want to look back in that scripture we just read. He said, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now in 1 Corinthians, it's a prohibition of the law for a woman to take authority over a man. What law is he speaking of? Well, it's the law of Genesis 3.16 that's spoken in the Garden of Eden in which God told Eve that because of her part in the fall, her husband would rule over her. And this is the reason it says in 1 Timothy, if a woman wants to know something in the worship of the church, be silent. Corinthians says, ask the husband when you get home. The husband is the head. Now notice in 1 Timothy, this is precisely where Paul goes next. He goes to the Garden of Eden to show where the prohibition began. And the obvious uh, importance of the mention of this is the creational principle that never changes. It is the steadfast, unmovable, unchangeable order of society that is rooted in God's infallible law. And listen to Paul's justification for not letting women speak. 1 Timothy 2.13, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam was the first in the order of humanity. Adam was given headship over the woman. In Ephesians 5, Paul discussed the church. He said, The head of the man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. He said, The church is subject to Christ, and the woman is subject to her husband. 
And notice it says Adam was not deceived. It was Eve who was deceived. Now what Eve should have done, I know there's a lot of controversy about, about these scriptures, uh, what Eve should have done. Eve should have taken the serpent's temptation to Adam, but instead she fell prey to Satan's deception. Albert Barnes gives this, I, I would call it a feminist stomping conclusion. He said this, this is the second reason why the woman should occupy a subordinate rank in all things. It is that in the most important situation in which she was ever placed, she had shown that she was not qualified to take the lead. She had evinced a readiness to yield to temptation, a feebleness of resistance, a pliancy of character, which showed that she was not adapted to the situation of headship, and which made it proper that she should ever afterwards occupy a subordinate situation. It is not meant here that Adam did not sin, nor even that he was not deceived by the tempter, but that the woman opposed a feebler resistance to the temptation than he would have done, and that the temptation was actually applied to her would have been ineffectual on him. Now you would take note of that, that this is while the woman was still perfect. She was not designed to be the head even before the fall. Now this is, this is a very interesting comment by Barnes and I, I promise you you're not likely to hear this recited in too many modern pulpits I mean I can see the faces of AOC and the squad just scrunching up and just disintegrating right now but look again at 1st Timothy chapter 3 verses 6 and 7 and the qualifications of the pastor it says not a novice lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, the implication of that in connection with 2 Timothy 2.14 is that the man in the office of pastor is by way of his constitution, by way of his creational aptitude, less likely to fall prey to the devil. And that's certainly not to say that women are more inclined to evil. That's not what the Bible is teaching. And then further, if it's the order of creation for the woman to be in submission to the man, how would God reverse that order? How would he ignore that order in the pastorate when I've already told you that the pastor stands in the place of Jesus Christ before the people? The scripture says the head of Christ is God, the head of man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. And so for a woman to usurp the authority of the man, of God's given authority, that is, that is to usurp God's given authority. And that's not a, just a, a mere mistake of misinterpretation. This, this is a black, blasphemous satanic attack on God's divine order. This is a function of the entire upheaval of society by a demonic influence that undermines the only institution on earth that upholds divine authority. And thus in Revelation 2, a woman in authority in the church is a Jezebel. This is not an inconsequential point of doctrine. Now I know there, there might be some women who do this out of ignorance, but when clear scriptures are presented, especially to those like Beth Moore, who's supposed to be educated in the scriptures, then this becomes an egregious violation. Now today, many objections are made because, folks, this is not culturally acceptable what I've just told you is not culturally acceptable religiously the world is engulfed with apostates who are easily defended, offended and would call this male domination but you know the scriptures never look at it this way they never approach this subject as male domination they approach this subject as a defined role for men and women in the way that God established the family first, established the, the society second, and then comes to the time of the church and establishes the way the church is to function. It is for God's good order. And any deviation from the created order leaves us con with confusion in all three areas, in family, society, and the church. And I think that you already know that changes in this have already destroyed families and they've given us an upside-down freakish society and has ruined what otherwise might be good churches that now have become Thyatirans and Laodiceans. I think that we can say with all certainty 
that when a church puts a woman into the pastorate, there is evidence there is already a steep spiritual decline. That will seal its destruction. It eliminates the possibility that it could be one of the Lord's churches. The choice of a woman in the past, as a pastor is theological liberalism that God will not stand. Now finally, for this today, tie us back into 1 Timothy 3. I want to re you read verse 2 with me again. A bishop, 1 Timothy 3, 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, listen, apt to teach. The last part of the verse says a pastor must have ability, aptitude to teach. But on the other hand, in chapter 2, verse 12, the apostle says what? He does not allow a woman to teach. Well, how do you reconcile those two statements if a woman can be a pastor but she can't teach? 1 Corinthians says it's a shame for a woman to speak in the church. Well, how should she be a pastor without speaking? Pastor is a man of authority. Hebrews says to the church, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. 1 Timothy 5.17 Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. So the scripture says the pastor rules in the church. He teaches doctrine in the church. Others submit to his authority. While 1 Timothy chapter 2 says women are not to have authority over men. That's in the home, in society, and folks, certainly, certainly it is in the church. This is a command that's drawn from principles of God's creation in Genesis, the book of beginnings. But once again, we, we don't expect that apostates will agree with us because they don't see the Bible as the final authority. The Bible is not their absolute truth. And when that happens, you can be sure the culture will rule. If we're not sanctified and being made in the image of Jesus Christ, then we will seek idols. We will seek idols of our imagination. And there are none that loom as large as self-idolization. That is, I am the standard. What I think matters. I am the standard. And folks, that is no standard at all. So maybe Joyce Meyer is right. You are little God. She thinks she is. She does her own thing. Beth Moore is a little God. She does her own thing. And all these churches that have women pastors are worshipers of gods of their imagination. They do their own thing, not the New Testament thing. So it leaves us with only one option. The man who pastors the church has an inward call from the Holy Spirit. He has an outward call, confirmed call from the church, and he has a restricted call that conforms to his sex. So if a woman says that she has the inward call, which is what Beth Moore claims, if she says she has the inward call and she rejects the restricted call and her subjective inward call trumps all authority of the church, if the objective call, outward call doesn't agree. Did you get all that? The sum of that teaching is what? I am God. I am God. As I said, it isn't, this isn't an inconsequential mistake. This is blasphemy against the one true living God. As long as I'm here, I don't know how much time I have left, but as long as I'm here, Berean will not go there. Someday you'll face the difficulty, inevitably you will, of choosing a new pastor. And maybe this church will be one of those on the monthly list of churches that have no pastor you'll not have trouble finding apostates. There will be many that will apply for the job. You won't have any trouble finding the apostates, but if you settle for one of them, you will no longer be a church of Jesus Christ. The representative of Jesus Christ is the pastor in the church. God bound himself by what he says in the word. He can't speak or do anything that is against what he declares himself to be. The scripture says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that forever binds us to the infallible word of God. The culture disagrees. I'm, I know it, you know it. I'm sure I'm not the first to tell you this, that the culture, this culture will send you to hell. 
We preach Christ crucified, buried, risen from the dead, and coming again. And that is true regardless of what the culture thinks. And so we'll live that way. We'll live by the word of God so that we won't be ashamed when Jesus comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truths that we find in your word. We know that the word is not popular. We know this preaching is rejected across the world today, especially in this country and in this state, in, in this county, in this city. These ideas are foreign to the ears and people don't want to hear them. They reject your word. Lord, I pray that you would change hearts because we know you're the only one who can. I can't stand here and give an argument that will change the unregenerate heart of any person. I can't win anybody over by a logical argument. It takes the Holy Spirit working in the heart to change that underlying sinful condition and open up the ears and the heart to the understanding of the truth of your word. Lord, we do pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us today. And if what I've said today just turns out to be agreement for everybody here, praise, praise you for that. We're thankful for that. If that's all that it is, then, Lord, we thank you for agreement. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us a group of people who stand unreservedly on the word of God, no matter what this culture says. Be with this church, Lord. Bless us. Build us. Help us to be made more and more into your image. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you listened all the way through, and I haven't been canceled yet. I don't, don't know what's going to happen on the way out the door just yet. Uh, but, uh, you know, when we preach like this, I do want to tell you, I'm not angry. I'm not angry at anyone. I'm angry at Satan. Uh, but I'm not angry at anyone else. I know that the devil has such powers that we can't even imagine how powerful that he is to blind the eyes of people to the truth of God's word it happens all the time it happens everywhere and if we ever get up in our own strength and think that somehow something I say today is going to change the world well no it's not it's really not um, the only thing that's going to change the world is the Lord Jesus Christ him coming again and establish a kingdom on this earth and that's what I'm praying for and we'll hold out faithful until he does one scripture for our benediction today as we close. And this is also in 1 Timothy in the fourth fourth chapter. And I think good advice for us, uh, no matter how old you are, 1 Timothy 4.12, let no man despise thy youth. Of course, Paul was talking to Timothy there, the young man. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Good advice for us all. God be with you, and we hope to see you next Lord's Day. And oh, three o'clock this afternoon. We do have a class this afternoon, so we'll hope to see you then. Otherwise, 10 30 next Sunday morning, and you are dismissed. Thank you for listening to this presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Roner Park, California. If you would like further information about our church, please feel free to call us at area code 707 584 7275 or write to us at Berean Baptist Church, 6298 Country Club Drive, Rohnert Park, California, 94928. Additionally, you may visit us online at www.bebaptist.org.